Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. You know, a lot of people have been talking lately about Alzheimer's and uh, and dementia. I think that it's an issue as uh, lots of us are aging and we have uh, aging parents. And also, frankly, COVID, uh, long COVID, et cetera, uh, might have impacted that. And then I heard a lot of people talking about how concussions um, have some uh, have some impact on dementia or Alzheimer's. And so uh, I got recommended a gentleman that is an expert in this area. His name is Dr. Dan Goodenow, and he is the founder and CEO of Prodrome Sciences. He's a neuroscientist, he's an inventor, and he's a longevity expert. And he's coming to us uh, from uh, Los Angeles. Uh, he actually uh, has some uh, education from Canada, the University of Alberta. So we'll have to uh, delve into that a little bit so we can feel proud of a Canadian done good. Um, and uh, and he's an expert, I believe, in Alzheimer's and also in some some supplements uh, that he thinks can help dramatically uh, uh, in that disease. Sir, how are you? Welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. Nice to meet you, Brian. Yeah, so we can kind of go in all directions you may wish to go. That's for Excellent. Sure. So tell us a little bit about what uh, your firm uh, has done and is doing, if you could. Uh, you, I understand, sure. uh, are uh, researching in Alzheimer's and you've developed a line of supplements. Is that correct? That's correct. So this technology all starts from um, a concept called non-targeted metabolomics. It's basically the ability to measure thousands of small molecules in any kind of biological fluid. And that was really my first patented invention back in 99 now, in 2000. And using that technology, you can measure thousands of molecules in the blood simultaneously. And the human body is really like that. It's a bioreactor. We're, we're designed to work, essentially. And then, then at some point in time, certain systems become dysfunctional, which people talk about aging and so on. And when I was looking, using this technology for many things, colon cancer, pancreatic, autism, and in Alzheimer's disease, when we looked at the, what was the biochemical correlation? Could we identify, you know, if you can physically see somebody that looks different than you in terms of a cancer, in terms of dementia, then there has to be a biological counterpart to that. And this technology allowed me to do that in many different diseases. And when this technology was applied to Alzheimer's and cognitive impairment and the different severities, right? Because some people have subjective memory complaints. I can't remember my keys. I can't find the right word for what I'm trying to figure out. And that's first where it starts. Then you get this mild cognitive impairment. And then it gets severe enough that it really affects your daily living. Like you can't actually function. You might leave your 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 stove on or, or it becomes quite dangerous. And so this is not just a, it's not a light switch. It's not like yes, no answer. It's a how much answer. And so when we're looking at that scale of cognitively normal to severe dementia, a certain class of molecules was observed in the blood called plasmalogens. And no one's plasmalogens. really- Plasmalogens. Plasmalogens. And these molecules are really essential to human health. And there's not small amounts of it. 20 to 30% of the phospholipids in your brain are these molecules. And what makes them really weird is that you have to make most of them yourself. You get very, very little from our diet because they're designed for protection. And they are involved in the critical membrane structure. So I tell people the human body, we exist based on compartmentalization right? Your heart separated from your lungs, separated from your brain. So you can do certain functions in certain areas without affecting others. Where you have your kitchen and your bathroom and your bedroom separated in your house. And in our buildings, we do that with walls, right? Plaster and wood. And in your body, that separation, that compartmentalization is done using phospholipids. And this is the biological walls that you make. And these plasmalogens are a critical component of those biological walls. And when they degenerate over time, we stop making enough of them. The walls lose their fluidity. The ability to move materials in and out starts getting disrupted. And when it comes to neurological function, it becomes extremely noticeable because that's kind of the canary in the coal mine, if you will, in terms of membrane structure. So and so that's we, what- How do we yeah. create these plasmalogens? They're very interesting. So they're, they're so important to human physiology that we don't require any dietary. Your body makes it from scratch, kind of like it makes cholesterol from a simple little two carbon molecule. And plasmalogens the same way. You make them from the, the simplest molecules. Any kind of fat, any kind of carbohydrate essentially can be used as starting material to make plasmalogens. So they're so important that we do not require diet 
intervention. Problem is, we have, we're now dependent on our internal systems to make it. And it's one of the strange systems in that there's a certain organelle. So inside your cells, so you have a trillion cells in your body, and inside every single cell, again, there's compartmentalization. You have a mitochondria, you have a paroxysm, you have little subcompartments. And one of these subcompartments is called a paroxysm. And it's an organelle makes peroxide. So it's, it's an oxidatively demanding thing, but it's anabolic. Your body uses it to make things. So it chews up fats and actually make the products from your peroxisomes make your cholesterol, but they also make your plasmalogens. And these plasmalogens are a single non-redundant system. There's no backup plan for making these things. So when you stop losing your plasmalogens, there's really no backup plan. And so when you look at a um, brain shrinkage, and you, you talked earlier about concussions, you talk about um, COVID, or you talk about um, Parkinson's and other neurological disorders that can all contribute to reduced cognitive functioning. That's overall general mental health. One of the things that really occurs with, with humans is that our brains shrink. And it's kind of like a grape shrinking into a raisin. It doesn't shrink from the outside in, it shrinks from the inside. Okay, and, and it pulls it in. Like, and so a grape is full of water and it's made mostly of water. And when it shrinks into a raisin, it loses, it gets dehydrated. But the human brain is basically made of fat. Okay, so when it shrinks, it doesn't shrink because it loses water, it shrinks because it loses fat. Okay, because that's what keeps all these membranes in place. And so plasmalogens are one of those key, key components. And so they decrease in the human brain with age um, and, um, and in your blood. So I discovered that these molecules were deficient and they correlated, the severity of the deficiency correlated with the severity of cognitive impairment. And I've written, we've done really large studies with Russian University in Chicago, Japan, elsewhere. So thousands and thousands and thousands of blood samples correlated this and validated this with the Alzheimer's Association and, and so on. And so the question, so the, the association between plasmalogens and Alzheimer's, both in the blood and in the brain, is extremely well established. The problem is, what do you do about it? Um, you know, it's a, it's and so that's one of the things as a, being a chemist as well as a you know neurochemist is designing and building precursors. Many people will know about L-dopa for Parkinson's, for example, right? The miracle drug for Parkinson's. L-dopa is essentially a supplement branded as a drug. Okay, so one of the most remarkable miracle drugs of our time is, if anyone saw the movie Awakenings, for example, is this idea of L-dopa restoring dopamine function for people with Parkinson's. But L-dopa is just a precursor for dopamine. So technically, it's a natural molecule of your human body. It's technical, technically a supplement, no different than taking, you know, vitamins. It's, it's like dopamine? Well, it's a precursor to dopamine. So and we so should you all just have sex and be happier and we'll get dopamine. Right. The problem is getting it there. Okay. So if you, you can't take pure dopamine because it, L dopa is a precursor. So it goes, you take it and it can enter the brain and it can enter the cells and the cells then take that dopa, L dopa and convert it into dopamine. And the problem with Parkinson's is that you got a small little pea sized part of your brain called the substantia nigra that degenerates. It's very like the dopaminergic system is actually quite a small part of the human brain. And so you got to bathe the entire body in extra dopamine just to help that little pea-sized part of your brain. So that's the, that's the negative consequence of it. Um, but the point conceptually is important. It's a precursor. Okay, you take this metabolic precursor. And so what I did is I designed basically the equivalent of L-DOPA, but for Parkinson, for, for Alzheimer's, which was the plasmalogen precursor, because you can't eat them because your stomach acids will digest them. Um, and so you're, because you think, oh, wow, plasmalogens are everywhere. So if I take, you know, if I eat animal products, I should get plasmalogens in my food supply, right? And that's partially true, but the problem is they don't make it past your gut. And so you need to have a precursor, still part of the human biochemical system, like L-DOPA is, that can enter the body, enter the brain, enter the cells, and restore plasmalogens um, in situ or at the site of activity. So I designed precursors that could do exactly that several different patented lines of, of, of precursors. But the natural product ones are, um, that was in an old life. I've now redesigned them into um, natural products. They're still the same. Like when you buy um, vitamin C at, at the pharmacy, 
Okay, you're getting actual vitamin C. You're just not getting it from an orange. And so you buy you you make it, but it's a it's a it's a you manufacture the exact identical molecule that the human body uses. And so I manufacture the precursor to these plasmalogens. And there's different types. Some plasmalogens are involved in the synapse, like your neuromuscular junction for muscle movement. And the synapse is where one neuron communicates to another. And that I tell people, some people think the, com the human brain is like a computer, but it's not. It's really, it's more like the wiring harness on your car. Okay, you have this, this, this pipe of wires, right? Just like the wires in your wall, for example, right? And then you have, and they, they transmit signals long distances. And then you have the light switch and the light switch basically connects two wires, okay? Put the power to the light bulb, put the power to the fan, right? And so your neurons work basically the same way. And so you have two parts of it. One is that wiring harness pipe. And the other one is the connection part. The connection part is called the synapse. That's where one neuron connects to another neuron. And that process, again, unlike the switch on your wall where you're physically moving a piece of copper or metal you know, that connects your wires, your body's made of biological material. And the biological material that your body uses is called, is again, lipids. And it works like a, the synapse, like where one neuron connects to another neuron. You can think of a shower head, like with, a, with a, all these little streams coming out of it. And if you imagine just turning your shower on and off, on and off, on and off, you just, you pulse this groups of water. That's kind of how a neuron synapse works. And it, it pulses out these neurotransmitters. So in Parkinson's, it's dopamine. You know, people think about depression, serotonin, noradrenaline. Alzheimer's, it's acetylcholine is the, is the critical one. And then people take, you know, GABA and glutamate, those type of things. But for Alzheimer's, it's the cholinergic system. The trick is that physical process is a, called membrane fusion. So these, your neurotransmitters are kind of held into a little ball um, called a vesicle. And that vesicle moves to the synapse and it merges and it, and it releases its content. And the size and scope of this is really, really hard for people to comprehend. The human brain has about the same number of those vesicles as there are the grains of sand in the Hoover Dam. Okay. And more importantly, billions those, and billions. It's an enormous. The entire thing, think about every single grain of sand in the Hoover Dam. And then think of that bursting and reforming 100 times a second. That's what's going on right now as you and I are talking. And this is what gives the human brain such a massive computing power. Like a single human brain has the hertz rate of almost the equivalent of all computers sold in a year. Okay. Like it's, 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 it's a mind boggling. What's, what's the hertz rate? Uh, how many firing, how many um, firing events? Like, so if you take a vesicle, each vesicle fuses and sends neurotransmitters, that vent that's happening, each neuron of your brain is happening in the, anywhere from 10 to 100 times per second. Fascinating. Absolutely it's fascinating. Amazing. And what, what, what it does is it creates, it allows the human brain to all become quantum mechanical in its, you, you get to that level of fuzziness where, like, think about it. how do you choose a chicken sandwich over a salad at lunchtime? Like you're, 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 you're somehow you're, 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 you're moving your mind. Right. And it's like, and it's, it's, it's that level of that almost a quantum mechanical yes versus no event. Right. When it, like back in the physics, like when a light decides to be a, a particle or a wave, for example, but that's what gives the human brains huge computing power, but it's possible because, but we're, but we're, we're biological. We're not made of physical material. We're made of biological material. And the biological material there is those plasmalogens. You need 75% of the vesicles and that have to be plasmalogens for that to work properly. That's how much plasmalogens you need in the synapses. So those are called your omega-3 plasmalogens. People talk about fish oil and DHA. That's that's the important part there. Um, even though we fish should all oil just have uh, more salmon, more tuna, more fish oil. Always, that's a good thing. But the problem is they don't have plasmalogens. You, oh, that, I thought they did. Okay. Well, they have the DHA. So the DHA is a is a piece of a plasmalogen, but it's also other lipids. But then your 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 other part, the wiring in the wall, okay, that is totally different. That creates a really tight protective coating. And so people that have something like MS, multiple sclerosis, or autism, or stroke, when you talk about stroke and concussions. 
that's where the wiring harness, it's like a mouse got in there and started eating it. And so, and you, and you think about when you have a electrical problem at your home or in your house or your car, and it kind of it happens intermittently. Like if it's, so if you're from Canada, right? The, the car works fine when it's cold, but when it gets hot, it short circuits type of wiring issue. And yep. so that's kind of happens with the human brain, human neurological system, because when you have very low signal, it kind of gets through. But if you have too much, it short circuits. And that's white matter plasmalogens. And those are omega nines like you get from, it's what a, a different types. What so a anyways, that's, that's a whole babble about that. So what a fascinating conversation we're having tonight with Dr. Dan Goodenow, the founder and CEO of Prodome uh, Sciences. He's a neuroscientist, inventor, and a longevity expert. We're talking about Alzheimer's and plas. Oh my gosh, I can't pronounce it. Uh, pla plasmalogens. Very good. Plasmalogens. Plasmalogens and how that's the secret to, uh, to success uh, with our brain. Uh, we One need of them. them. Uh, and, uh, and that's uh, how we, uh, we can um, not get Alzheimer's. Uh, we're going to take a break for some messages and come back in just two minutes with Dr. Dan Goodenow. Uh, stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, uh, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Really a uh, very interesting conversation, a very scientific, um, but a very uh, important conversation we're having tonight with Dr. Dayan Goodenow. He's the founder and CEO of Prodrome Sciences. He's a neuroscientist, an inventor, and a longevity expert. He's got a PhD from the University of uh, Alberta um, uh, in medicine, medicine, and psychiatry, and he's got a Bachelor of Science from the University of Saskatchewan. He's now in LA, so I presume that there was something about uh, the United States and California that attracted you to leave the prairies. Yeah, well, I set up a big company in Canada. I brought the technology here. We did a lot of work in Canada, so just the way it happened, we've actually done a lot of work here in Ontario, uh, previous uh, lab company called CML Labs. We ran about 45,000 colon cancer screenings, so we ran one of the largest if not the largest colonoscopy trial in Canada's history, show that we could diagnose colon cancer at uh, stage zero using the same technology we use for inborn errors metabolism. But, you know, the world is a strange place. And so that didn't, um, and we started launching it in Ontario just before CML got bought out by Life Labs. Yep. And uh, Life Labs had the government contract with the FIT test so that they didn't like to have two competing tests. So that didn't work out so well. It, it's still sold in Japan. And we, we offer that kind of advanced blood testing to a lot of people. So, yeah, so we've done a lot of work over the years. But we're talking, um, but we're talking about uh, Alzheimer's primarily uh, tonight yeah. and uh, plasmalogen. Uh, I want to read uh, you all, if I could, uh, um, a little bit of explanation the doctor has on his website that describes uh, what his passion is, which I think is really kind of interesting. I believe that disease is predictable and that the leading cause of death is ignorance and inaction. My mission is to change the status quo, go beyond the diagnosis of disease and advance precision preventive medicine into mainstream medical practice. Over the past 30 years, I've invented and developed advanced diagnostic and bioinformatic technologies designed to manufacture novel and natural biochemical precursors and identified a treasure trove of biochemical markers that predict numerous diseases, including Alzheimer's and dementia, mm -hmm. Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, stroke, autism, ALS, multiple system atrophy, various mental illnesses, and cancers. The study of plasmalogens is vital in predicting several diseases. Plasmalogens are critical membrane components that help cells communicate with each other and function harmoniously. I've studied plasmalogens since 2006, and research has expanded to show that plasmalogens are the root cause of neurodegeneration that leads to Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and MS. My passion is to educate the world about the life extending benefits possible when plasmalogen health is harnessed. That's a pretty good passion. It is, and it, and it comes from experience in the sense that people, re regular people, they kind of don't understand the disconnect, right? And they're just, and they're, and they're, their basic intelligence is correct. It's like, why don't we have more of these technologies available to ourselves? And fundamentally, it's not due to a lack of knowledge. Our knowledge base in science is extremely valid, extremely robust on multiple levels. Um, the challenge is implementation. It's actually getting it and educating and getting doctors using the stuff that we have available to us. Okay, that's what's so shocking when people start realizing 
this plasmalogen story. I published this stuff in 2006, 2007. Five independent population, that's a long time ago now, right? And we could restore these plasmalogens back then. And by getting it into the system, that's where the colon cancer screening, pancreatic cancer, like virtually no, women, no woman should die of ovarian cancer. We can diagnose that long, long in advance. Okay, and, it, and, and so these are things that just aren't breast cancer. We just published a paper in breast cancer in Japan, pre and post surgery, you know, determining who, you know, predictability of, of, of breast cancer in women. So, and for most people, this is, is actually logical. And they think that human health somehow follows rules that nothing else in our life follow. And they throw away all their logic. They think it's, they, they get so scared of the jargon and this, and the black box of medicine and, and the doctors and everyone, they create this language that nobody can kind of pierce into. And so that's kind of where, where I really came up against the wall saying, what's the point of doing more and more? Like these large clinical trials of rush longevity research, if nobody uses this stuff. So now we have, I have over 600 doctors in our, in our network that we work with across the country, across the world. And this kind of advanced technology is now being used by individual doctors in real people, real practices, not big, huge, you know, clinical trials where we're sitting in some glass tower, watching people live and die and say, Hey, I can predict that guy dying. Oh, I can, you know, okay. and then it never so, gets any. Okay. So what do you do? Tell me exactly what you do. So you, you're, what you're saying is plasmalogen or the lack thereof is the, the cause of Alzheimer's. And so it's a, it's a leading contributor. And I use plasmalogens kind of as a Trojan horse in a sense, hey, because it's a big hammer, okay? It's like saying nitrogen or water is the only reason your plants grow. Well, those are, big, those are the big two things in your garden. If you don't have water, you have nothing. Next thing is, you know, if you don't have nitrogen, then you don't have anything either. But then you still need potassium, you still need, you know, potash, and you still need, you know, phosphorus. So, but the plasmalogens are a really, really big hammer. Okay, so can you can you do a test to find Absolutely. out whether you've got the right amount of plasmalogen? Yes, we do that all the time. What is so it? Yes, a blood we, test or what? Yeah, blood, simple blood test. Um, it's called the prodrome scan. That's what we use um, here. It's available anywhere. So and it's so like we, a cholesterol test or something. Correct. Like that. But we it's an integrated test because we look at because your human body is built to be in balance. And I tell people, think of yourself as a brewery. Okay, and you want sweet taste in beer or wine. And if you were making your own recipes at home, you don't just throw everything into the damn pot at once, right? You, you, you know, you flavor it properly. And so everything's in its proportion. So plasmalogens, like I said, are a big deal. Like you can't make it. So plasmalogens are like, like flour for your Christmas cake, right? And you go, and you go to your cupboard and you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make cake for the family. Right, I'm going to make two big pans of cake, and you get in the pantry, and you have all the ingredients. You have all the eggs. You have all the milk. You have all the blah blah blah. But you only have half as much half the flour that you need. Well, how much cake can you make? Half. Okay, it's the lowest. Like so, so plasma. Like you could have everything else. You could have your B12s are good and this and that, but your body can't physically make the plasmalogens or the okay, membranes. Okay, so the so if you do a blood test and you've got yeah. low plasmalogens. What do you do? Are you are you destined to get Alzheimer's? No, you can take supplements. There's actually also nutritional and dietary lifestyle issues that you can deal with. So plasmalogens are made in peroxisomes. So some of the things that, that are linked to higher risk of Alzheimer's is inactivity, um, type 3 diabetes that people call it, type 2. So you're fasting. So you want, the body needs to be, you know, the keto diet that people talk about in proper moderation helps. Um, caloric restriction is, is valuable because it forces the body's plasmalogens to work. Resistance training stimulates peroxisomes. So what you want to do from a, from a general health perspective, you want to create a health situation where your triglycerides are low, okay? HDL levels are high. Cholesterol is high as well. You want that in the mid 200s. And so these are things your body, you want to look at your system. So, so your body can make lots of plasmalogens. So exercise and don't eat too much. That's the, those are the main issues. And then obviously that only goes so far. It's like vitamin D, for example. So theoretically, if you go outside enough with your shirt off, you can make enough vitamin D, but it's almost impossible to get enough vitamin D without supplementing vitamin D in this world. Plasmalogen is the same way. So it is in theoretic, it's theoretically possible 
with vigilance to probably get pretty good levels. But in the practical world, you, most people will need supplementation. Okay, so explain, you said resistance training um, creates peroxides that creates plasmalogen. Is that correct? Stimulates, stimulates your peroxisomes. The peroxisomes, okay, so what are peroxisomes? Those are those intracellular organelles that are involved in fat metabolism, for example. Okay, so when people take, um, so, when, so when you look at, when you Google and you say, okay, what, what are triglyceride lowering activities? Most triglyceride lowering activities are peroxisomal stimulating activities. So people will take a, the old drugs called fibrates and stuff like that. And so that's a peroxisome. So peroxisomes are an organelle inside your cells that help your body break down fat, fatty acids, which is what you we, we live on. And so that's, and then the breakdown product of those fatty acids is used to make plasmalogens. So if, you are, if your body is efficient at metabolizing fat, then it's efficient at, ma at making plasmalogens. Okay, so why would being on the keto diet help that? Because when you're on the keto diet, you so your body runs in two gears. You have the fed gear and the fasted gear. Okay, in the fed gear, you eat a meal, and you have lots of energy coming up from your gut into your into your into your liver and things. And your body says, "Hold, man, I got way too much energy. There's no way I can possibly use all the energy from this meal." And so what your body does is it packages that it stores excess energy as fat in your fat cells. So after a meal, your butt could be really high with triglycerides, like white actually because it's sending all that fat for later then after you've gone into a fasting state you've used up all your short-term energy your fat cells become your stomach okay and the same basically the same type of enzymes that digested in your your intestine now digest it from your fat and you and your body releases this fatty acid into your bloodstream that's what you're that's what you live on during the fasted state when you think about it okay you're you're in the fasted state more hours per day than you are in a fed state so your body typically lives in the fasted state. So those fatty acids, when they're being sent to your cells, they turn on the peroxisomes because those peroxisomes are what are what um, process them. And so by by elongating that that time that you're sending free fatty acids in the fasting state, it just continually stimulates that. And then working out with your muscles, not just cardiovascular training, but mostly resistance training because that activates a bunch of muscle activity. And what happens when you break your muscles down forces your body to rebuild the muscles. And that whole rebuilding process is what is very healthy. I tell people exercise is bad for you. Recovering from exercise is good for you. Okay, so you, you exercise to recover from it, but the actual exercising itself, you're hurting yourself, but you're doing it in a controlled way so that when you recover from your exercise, you have, you're creating a reserve level of activity okay but let's come back to the keto diet if we could i understood yeah. the keto diet was like the atkins diet you're just not eating a lot of carbs what you're saying is it's what it's more like intermittent fasting where you're fasting for a long period right of time? It, it's it's it mimics caloric restriction okay so typically when you're in when you eat a meal you get carbohydrates you get glucose into your blood supply and that stimulates insulin secretion and what keto diet does is it when you're eating calories that are high protein, high fat, okay, you should always have fat with protein, okay, um, you know, as you eat. But so we, that doesn't create an insulin response. It just maintains a fasting. It's a it's they call it a it's like a fasting mimetic, if if you will. So your body still feels because basically what you're doing is you're eating the same type of stuff that your fat cells are releasing. So your body thinks that it's almost your fat cells sending you energy, not your stomach sending you energy. And so you're by by having a highly fat dense, protein dense um, snack, you you don't get an insulin response. And then you're you're basically maintaining the the fasting state. Okay. What about these people that believe in intermittent fasting, where they're fasting for 16 or whatever hours a day? I'm a big believer in that. That's one of the best things. Breakfast is the worst meal of the day. You should, you should get most of your calories in like a six hour window. Um, like if you can get your first meal a day around two o'clock, have a, have a nice, good, satisfying meal, have a kind of a low carbo snack later on, but yeah, caloric restriction. I'm a, I'm a bigger believer in caloric restriction than keto. Keto is just you know, you want to, you want caloric restriction. Your body um, is activated 
when it's fasting. Why? Why can't I know breakfast? I thought that's the energy you need for the day. No, uh, breakfast is breaking your fast. Okay, that's the name of it. It's to break your fast, and what it does is so. Yeah, breakfast is like the worst meal of the day. Um, if you do have to have a breakfast, make sure it's like a, a good high egg type. Definitely no sugar for breakfast, that type of thing. Like orange juice for breakfast is just the worst thing in the possible world you can have for yourself. If you have sweets, have them as part of your meal. And also have them at the end of your meal, not at the beginning of your meal. Okay, because you want to dilute that out through your, your, your supply. Because eating is quite stressful for the human body. Like you're hitting yourself with a whole, your body, like, look, your body's intelligent, but it's behind a curtain, right? It doesn't know what you're going to do in the next 20 minutes. Are you going to have, you know, a pint of ice cream? Are you going to have pineapple juice? Are you going to eat a steak? It doesn't know what's going to happen. So it has to react to you. It sounds okay? like you think we should be eating a steak at two o'clock. Well, and right. a fatty steak at that. Yeah, nice fatty steak. You can have a little bit of else, you know, have a little sweet afterwards if you want to. The trick is the hours of fasting afterwards. And then everyone should take their own, like, Men seem to have this intermittent fasting much easier than females. Um, and that's just a generalization. Everyone is different. Um, but ultimately, you have to look at what you yourself feel the best. If you can't do the long fasting, then make sure you, your, your, your snacking is in a, is in a, is a protein moderate. fat snack. Yeah. And moderate. And moderate, sense. yeah. yeah. And okay, then, so, so yeah. exercise, uh, particularly resistance uh, training, um, Caloric uh, restriction, uh, caloric intake restriction, um, uh, intermittent fasting or fasting as long as you uh, can, uh, breaking, uh, don't break the fast with breakfast, uh, try to stretch it out to lunchtime or even thereafter. Um, exactly. But and the biggest thing for exercise, I tell people, not to wag fingers at anyone, it's, uh, it's, it's the rest period. Often, I can't tell you how many perfect athletes, okay, their metabolite profile are just terrible because they don't give their body enough time to rest. And as you get older, it's even more important. It's great to work out, work out to failure, but take a day off because it's, it's the recovery from exercise that gives you your health benefit. If you don't give your body the time to recover, then you're now you're not getting the benefit from exercise. You're actually, your exercise is working against you and it, starting, and, it, and it just starts a continuous tear down process. So people think they need to work out six days a week. But it's not true. Two or three times a good exercise a week is and then walking and that kind of exercise is great every day. But when you're doing resistance training, that's the biggest thing people forget to do. They don't do a proper rest period in between times. But if we're doing all that and we still lack plasmalogen, how do we get it? Supplements. So proto neuro is for the brain. Like I first, I've been on neuro for two years now. I take about 50 milligrams, kilogram um, long-term. Um, it's a no brainer. Like quite frankly, the, the, the longevity benefit, okay, a 65-year-old with low plasmalogens has the same probability of living to their 70th birthday as a 95-year-old with high plasmalogens has of living to their 100th birthday. It's a 30-year it's a differential in lifespan based upon your blood plasmalogen levels. It's not trivial. It's, it's a okay, real Okay, so I've never heard of plasmalogens number. before. So where did this all come from? You're saying that even though you've done all these... Uh, clinical trials and all these studies and 50 papers, the world just doesn't understand you? It just doesn't fit the model for people. It's coming up now quite well. We just published the very first paper one month ago, came out full July 4th, actually, the first plasmalogen restoration paper um, in humans. Um, we've known about plasmalogen for many years for rare diseases in children, and um, that's coming to fruition. So now we have you know, many people like in our own personal lives, like we have lots of examples of, of recovery occurring, but it's, it's not, it's not magic. Okay. What we do is not magic at all. It's just. See, so if I want to, if I want to read the paper, if I want to get tested for plasmalogens yeah. and if I want to get the supplements, how do I do all that? Prodome.com will have those access. We can set you up with a doctor. You can, um, for sure. It's so prodome.com is where all the information is on that kind of testing and capabilities. And then we have dome.com. Yeah, just that's all there is to it. We're and, having uh, an interesting chat tonight uh, with uh, with a doctor that's telling us a lot about um, Alzheimer's, dementia, 
Um, his name is Dr. Dan Goodenow. He is the founder and CEO of Prodrome Sciences. He's a neuroscientist and inventor and longevity expert. He's uh, currently in uh, the Los Angeles, uh, California area, but he's from uh, University yeah. of Alberta and University of Saskatchewan with a PhD and a Bachelor of Science. He uh, has uh, set up uh, uh, businesses in the, in the health sciences and in, in uh, the prairies as well as in Ontario. And uh, he now is telling us that plasmalogen is, is the key thing that we need if we want to uh, live a long, healthy life with a brain that continues to work. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back uh, in just two minutes with Dr. Dan Goodenow and talk a little bit more about uh, Alzheimer's and dementia and uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, Parkinson's, et cetera, and, uh, and how exactly plasmalogen helps, how we can get it. Um, and uh, what the, uh, the causes of each one of these diseases are. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're having a fascinating conversation tonight with Dr. Dan Goodenow. He is the founder and CEO of Prodrome Science. He's a uh, scientist. He's a neuroscientist. He's an inventor, and he's a longevity expert. Uh, it's kind of interesting. We've been talking about plasmalogen um, and uh, and his focus as the founder and CEO of Pro Prodrome Sciences, where he uh, has as an objective to build a next generation team of dedicated researchers and medical professionals who are determined to maximize longevity for millions of people around the world. Maximize longevity. It's like the fountain of youth is what you're, you're after. Um, he's uh, currently got over 10 clinical trials ongoing with over 8,000 people globally. Their trials are focused on various aspects of aging and diseases, such as various cancers, Alzheimer's disease and dementia, Parkinson's disease, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and depression. He's got extensive experience compiling and training teams of professionals. He's built ISO certified FDA compliant manufacturing facilities, laboratories, advanced programs for researching the biochemical mechanisms and causes of human health disorders and developing diagnostic and treatment solutions for them. And the focus that we're talking about tonight is plasmalogen, which is, uh, is it a lipid? Yes. It's a lipid in the brain and the rest of the body, but primarily the brain. No, that... all over. It's really critical for lung function, um, especially for long COVID sufferers. They need to get plasmalogens in their lungs. Um, your heart function, you know, it's, it's all, it's, we talk about the brain health and your neuromuscular junction health, but Children that are born with a proximal defect, most of them will die of pulmonary disease. So and if, if children are born prematurely, so premature babies will often get a, a disorder called bronchial dysplasia. That's called that's basically caused by a lack of plasmalogens in their lungs. And so when a mother, when a child is born, uh, mother's initial milk, the colostrum will have high levels of plasmalogens. And then over the course of the first three weeks, mother's milk decreases quite dramatically. The plasmalogen level goes down quite dramatically over the first roughly month or so. So it's, so by the end of the first month, the mother's milk has about 10% of the plasmalogens that they had at birth. So, so yeah, so plasmalogens are really so, important. So maybe really, the solution really is, is drinking mother's milk if it contains so much plasmalogen. Well, that's, that's, you know, I'm a farm boy. So that, that's, that's a matter of, you know, colostrum is, is a short-term issue. So you, you can't keep it up forever. And so, so yeah, so mothers should be obviously looking forward, you know, maintaining their health and, and wellness. And, um, and so, you know, we have a young company, so, you know, certainly all of the women in our company who have been pregnant, we definitely make sure they keep up on their plasmalogens during their pregnancy. And you say so, plasmalogen is something that you can test with a blood test. Is this blood yeah. test readily available from your local physician or do you have to go to a special clinic? Special clinic, um, check out online there for protom.com. That will, they'll set you up to find out what doctors in your area that, that does it. We normally do all through education. We certify doctors because this issue of like even simple concepts, people, the doctors, you know, get your uric acid test, your creatinine. There's a lot of these blood tests that we've been using for years, but they use them from a diagnostic yes versus no. Do I have kidney failure? Do I have this? That's not the value, the value is understanding how your biological system is working. And so I do a lot of training um, on doctors and I certify doctors at, at proper interpretation of your biochemical profile and, and how to, to correct that. So people, have, people think that there's this protagonistic role, but really the human body is adaptive, okay? What you see is the body's best case scenario under the circumstances. 
Okay. Like if you have fatty liver right now, your body is saying of all the possible options, the one least likely to kill me today is a fatty liver. Okay. It's adapted to a fatty liver. It's chosen a fatty liver as the least, as the best circumstance under those uh, under the conditions. So when you look at the human body and you look at its physiology and, and you get a blood test and you understand the biochemistry, what you're, what that biochemistry is telling you is the body, why, and then you have to ask, why is the body choosing this situation? Okay. Why do you have low, why you have muscle wasting, for instance, sarcopenia in the elderly, right? If they're, and you can look at that with the creatinine levels are low, so on and so forth. They're very, very simple tests. I've been measuring for years and years and years, but, and they tell you so much information. So I educate doctors. We have a certification protocol with doctors. So it's, I always urge people to, to have a, a trained physician working with you because the exact same biomarker could mean two different things in people. For example, plasma allergens, okay? Children with autism and women with MS will often have higher than normal levels in the blood. Okay, not for a good reason, for a bad reason. It's because another part of their cell isn't working. Their mitochondria aren't working. And since the mitochondria aren't working, your cells are pushing all this energy into your peroxisomes, forcing them to do extra work. And so, you, like, again, your body is designed to be balanced. And this idea that this yes, no answer for everything. Um, and so I train doctors on how to do all that. So, yes, yeah, it's accessible. And for are these doctors anybody. trained in Canada and the United States or just U.S.? All over the world. All over the world. And you can access them by going to prodome.com. Yeah. Excellent. And you said that a bunch of your research is available on your own, uh, Dr. Diane Goodenow. Uh, yeah. So website. on drgoodenow.com, there's a bunch more educational resources. I'll, I walked people through how to interpret certain blood test results, but also diseases. You know, people like this big scandal with Alzheimer's and the amyloid hypothesis. And but we knew that was wrong back in 91. Researchers, Brock showed this. Like, that's what I'm trying to say to people is that education and the knowledge base has been there for a long, long time. Um, but getting it into the individual's hands so that they can actually make use of it. So we have dramatic results in MS and autism and Parkinson's. So in MS, uh, there was a, you know, a big rage a couple of years ago by the Zam Z Zambodi protocol, which believed that there was a blockage in, uh, in, um, in, in not the aorta, but uh, in veins coming out of the brain, which uh, meant that you couldn't drain your blood out of the brain and you left in a whole bunch of, uh, of stuff such that uh, iron particularly that destroyed uh, white blood cells and the white parts of your brain cells. And they uh, were doing, uh, um, you know, what do you call it? Uh, stents and things like this, uh, uh, and angioplasty to open up the veins, to open up uh, the drainage out of the brain. And then yeah. a couple of years later, it was diagnosed as as bunk. Like there's usually a kernel of truth in everything; otherwise, it wouldn't get any legs at all. Okay, and that and and the problem is downstream. See, diseases are complex. Health actually isn't. Health is a singularity. Your health, my health, your mom's health, your kid's health. Health is health. Health. We know what health is. Very, very. We have decades, centuries of data on what health is. Okay, so health is a singularity. Deviation from health creates disease. And that's where it gets very complex as you get further. Multiple sclerosis is, multiple sclerosis and autism are fundamentally the same disease. Okay, it's a mitochondrial dysfunction. Multiple sclerosis and autism are the same disease? Yeah, well, they're just closest people don't have control of their bodies. They can't they can't walk well. And and autism is just overactive brains, isn't it? No, it's mitochondrial dysfunction. So there's about a three to one gender bias. And we did longitudinal studies that have written extensively on autism. And we're starting a very large trial in autism in the next month or so. And what, what is the gender bias? Female? In autism, it's three to one. So three times for every four person with autism, three of them are boys, one of them is a girl. Okay. Oh, so it's, I thought it was primarily female. You're saying it's primarily male. Oh, no, autism is all, almost all, all male. And then and the, symptomatic, the symptomology is quite different in females as well. But see, pre-puberty, the difference between males and females is their beta estradiol levels in their blood. So beta, women get, have basic beta estradiol. And beta estradiol is a very, very powerful neuroprotectant. It protects neurons very dramatically. And about 25% of boys have girl levels of beta estradiol. And about 25% of girls have boy levels. 
Okay, and this looks at the gender bias. And so the mitochondrial insufficiency that it causes autism and it causes white matter inflammation. So it's a, it's a white matter disease, but it's a white matter of the brain. Fast forward 20 some years, multiple sclerosis is the exact opposite. Okay, it's three to one ratio in the opposite direction. For every four people with, with, with relapsing or remitting multiple sclerosis, approximately three of those are girls, one of those are boys. Okay, and usually boys don't get relapsed or men now. People with mm-hmm. autism get multiple sclerosis? No, it's the, the it's the, it gets manifested differently. So when females ha- like to have relapsing or remitting MS, okay, in their childbearing years, very frequently when they get pregnant, when they get in the pro-estrous cycle, their symptoms go away. They'll say, oh, I've never felt better in my entire life is when I was pregnant. And then they, they live in this relapsing or remitting stage until they hit menopause. And it's when menopause hits that most, multiple sclerosis starts to accelerate into the secondary progressive phase when they lose that protective quality of, of beta estrogen, beta estradiol or estrogen. And so, but mitochondrial dysfunction is the core component of MS and it's, uh, you know, can be triggered like people. Can, and so that's why if you take a look at aut- autism, autism is a strange disease because it, it used to be considered a neurodevelopment disorder. Like back in the 40s and 50s, you'd have one child in 100,000, 300,000 get autism. And then you would be, the child would be born with autism. It'd be, it'd be a neurodevelopmental disorder, okay? Children are not born with autism anymore. They get autism, okay? And it gets triggered. We have 5%, 5% of the boys in, in Scotland have autism, 5%. How do you, how do you get an autism? An number. You, hmm? you catch it, you develop it. How do you get it? It's not um, It gets triggered. No, it's not contagious, of course, um, but it's it gets triggered. And so what happens is it could have a hundred different causes of autism. There's no one cause of autism. So if you have a if you have a mitochondrial insufficiency, okay, you have a, a weakened mitochondria, then whatever happens to you that that tips you over the cliff, okay, then it could be anything. It could be an adverse reaction to a vaccine. It could be getting your head hit. It could be getting a little bit of encep- encephalitis. It could be it could be a small concussion. It could be a bad flu virus. It could you be can get autism toxicity. from concussion. Sure, whatever whatever caused. So what what happens is it it creates a triggering event, okay? And then what happens is these autoimmune diseases they call them autoimmune, but really what they are is the body's inability to resolve inflammation. Okay, and so this is what happens with COVID. COVID is it creates an autoimmune cycle in individuals that they can't catch up. They can't get their heads above water on the cycle. So your your immune system is designed to look for unhealthy cells. Okay, and then when it finds an unhealthy cell, it piles on and, so, and comes around and, and kills that cell. And it does a lot of it in the local area. It's stressful but it's only supposed to affect the damaged cell. It's not supposed to affect the healthy cells around the inflammation. But if your cells around the inflammation are not healthy, mitochondrial impaired, for example, they become damaged from the natural inflammation response. And then they now become pro-inflammatory. And so now you get this, and that's essentially autoimmune, is where your immune system acting in its normal capacity has now created a propagation of it's, it's turned a healthy cell into an unhealthy cell, which is now further being um, stimulating your immune system. So your immune system never goes away. It just constantly is in track. And so it when we look at the immune autism, system into overdrive. Right. And so, and so, and so we deal with the suppressive process that like people try to suppress the T cells, they try to suppress the immune system. But reality is if you can fix the inside of the cell, then the, the fire burns out. And um, you you prevent if you if if you if you protect the cells around the inflammation, the inflammation has no place to go, and it and it dies itself out. It's like it's like putting a a band of water around a fire, and so eventually it's like a fire break. You know you want the fire to burn out on the inside and then go away, and you don't want it to spread to the next house and the house after that and the house after that and the house after that. We're chatting tonight with Dr. Dan Goodenow. He is the CEO of. Uh of a company that is uh, developing a uh, nutritional supplement, I guess is the uh, the right way uh, to describe it, um, uh, that will help us uh, get something that we need uh, for brain health. Uh, brain health. Um, the website people uh, should go to, sir, is what? 
Um, the science behind it all is at drgoodnow.com. The products are available at prodrome.com. Prodrome.com. We're going to take a break uh, for some final messages and come back with some concluding comments in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. A really fascinating conversation tonight with Dr. Dayan Goodenow. He's the founder and CEO of Pro Drone Sciences. Uh, he is a neuroscientist, an inventor, and a longevity expert. And what we've been talking about tonight is plasmalogen, uh, the deficiencies that we may have of plasmalogen in our body, primarily the brain, but everywhere else. He reminds us uh, that they're necessary in the body and that it can cause a lot of problems. Alzheimer's is the one that we've been really primarily focused on. Uh, he's directed us to his uh, website uh, for Dr. Dan good now uh, if uh, we want to get some of the research and uh, and background and academic uh, articles and uh, to his company's website uh, uh, prodrome uh, that's uh, p r o d r o m e dot com prodrome uh, for information on where we can get our blood um, study to see if we've got uh, low levels of, uh, of plasmalogen uh, and also a connection to doctors that have been trained in interpreting the results to figure out uh, what to do and where and how we can get these supplements. In addition, we've had an interesting conversation about the importance of, uh, of fitness, um, about uh, resistance training, about intermittent fasting, about not having a big breakfast, about uh, the benefits of the keto diet. I guess also about omega-3 fatty acids that we can get from salmon or, or tuna or, or omega-3 fatty acids supplements. It's been a fascinating conversation. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us and, and telling us a little bit about you and your science and, and your company. I really appreciate it. I got one really important question to ask you, though. Can I still have coffee in the morning? I do. I take most of my supplements in the morning with coffee. A lot of supplements I take on an empty stomach and then only things that require digestion do I take. But yeah, I'm a big coffee is great for you. It's, it's a lot of studies on it. So, you know, I'm biased because I like my coffee in the morning. Um, but yeah, so. A lot of these things are healthy in moderation, like anything in this world. But We're still allowed red thing, wine? Again, a little bit in moderation. Um, there's things like your body needs, like you can't just live in a bubble, okay? But you want, so you want to create healthy stress, okay? Healthy mental stress, healthy physical stress, and healthy dietary stress to a certain degree. Because if you're, if you're, if, if you're, you'll atrophy, okay? Like it's like you can't lie in bed and just say, oh, I'm going to get perfect air and things, and your body will just, go to mush right so the human body all parts of it are designed to have a push and pull system you have to, you want to have a cycle every day you want to have a, a good meal then you want to have a good fast okay you you're and you want to have that kind of pull and, and it keeps your body awake like we live because we have to right like you like it's you, you stimulate your your environment needs to be stimulating so yeah so these things in moderation are fine. It's when we get these really monolithic diets or monolithic behaviors that generally have um, the largest negative consequences for us. You've, you've talked about the importance of plasmalogen and uh, and how we can take some supplements to uh, forestall uh, the onset, I guess, of, all, of Alzheimer's and some other diseases. If you've already got Alzheimer's, is it still uh, is it is it solvable or is this something you have to take before you get Alzheimer's to to not get Alzheimer's? It's both. So we just published a paper in uh, Frontiers of Medicine about a month ago, and it was a clinical trial where we did escalating dose of plasmalogen supplementation. Okay, showing that we could target the plasmalogen that we want to elevate. We did it in a dose dependent manner, and this had some people with mild cognitive impairment, but people with more severe. Uh, rating scales are called clinical dementia rating. And usually it's hard to do trials with people that are too demented because it's hard for them to follow the guidelines and they, they need to make sure they're a proper caregiver at home and so on. But what was interesting in the study is that the people that were the most severely cognitively impaired benefited the most. Okay, 75% mm -hmm. of the people that had higher degrees of cognitive impairment improved in a four month period, a full score, a full score on the clinical dementia rating went from a three to a, went from a two to a one. Okay, so this is and in our own personal experience, I have family members that have been dramatically impacted by providing the plasmalogens. And so we see 
pretty serious changes in individuals. Typically, it needs a bit of higher dose. So yes. Now, but there you're 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 pushing the tide backwards, right? Like we're trying to refill the blank. Like you got to fill fill the brain back in, and that's one of the work that we're doing with the new MRI technologies and so more technology where we do believe that we can rebuild human brains. Um, by select, it, there's no reason why you can't turn a raisin back into a grape if we do it properly, and um, and that's kind of the things that we're we're working on. So the answer is absolutely yes. Um, it just it, you have to work at it properly. Dr. Dan Goodnell, thank you so much for joining us and telling us about uh, Plasmalogen and about your uh, company. I'm just going to read uh, something that he's got on his website, if I could. Stop the sands of time. Discover the link between plasmalogens and longevity. The leading cause of death is ignorance and inaction. Learn about age-associated plasmalogen deficiency, neurodegeneration, and death, and what you can do to check your plasmalogen levels and restore them to healthy, youthful levels. Sounds pretty inspiring, sir. I really appreciate you joining us, telling us about Plasmalogen, uh, the website that we can go to, um, and uh, and how we've got to all exercise and uh, and and uh, eat a healthy diet in addition to uh, everything else you suggested. That's our show for tonight, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Brian Crombie. You've been listening listening to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. You can stream me online, even from Los Angeles at www.saga960am.ca, or you can tune me in in the Toronto area at 9.60 a.m. All my podcasts and video casts are available after the fact at briancrombie.com. Good night, everybody. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Appreciate it. Oh.